All right. Hello again. So we will start now with um, our plenary talk um, given by uh, Hannah Wood. Um, Hannah is currently the um, the curator for um, arach uh, uh, arachnids and myriapods at the um, National, Muse uh, National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian. And uh, to give you a little bit about her background, uh, she obtained her master's degree uh, at San Francisco State University um, under the supervision of Charles Griswold. And uh, she received her PhD from UC Berkeley, um, again, under the supervision of Charles Griswold, along with Rosie Gillespie. And uh, she um, made her, did her first postdoc with Nikolai Scharf at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and um, had the second uh, NSF-funded postdoc at uh, UC Davis um, uh, in the uh, lab of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Okay, that's it. So, um, <laughs> so her talk is um, uh, called uh, uh, "Pulpy Manoid Spiders: Bizarre Morphologies, Unusual Behaviors, and Extreme Speeds." And... Thank you, and uh, thank you to my hosts for inviting me to come give this talk. Okay. So my the big research question for me and uh, the the work that I do is trying to understand morphological diversification. So understanding how you go from something like the ancestral finch that got blown by a chance event to the Hawaiian island and then radiated into these um, the Hawaiian honey creepers. Except of course I don't work on birds. I work on spiders. Um, and so my question um, is looking at how you go from something like this, which is sort of what and the a, a palpamanoid looks like, to something like this, um, where you have this radiation, these unusual carapace and collisceral shapes, um, and trying to understand how that happened. And the way that I do this um, is first by sort of looking at extrinsic factors. So external features of the environment, competition between species, selection, um, chance events, you know, such as, you know, biogeography um, events. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about for part one of the talk. So these external events that might have spurred morphological diversification. And for my research, I'm also really interested in the intrinsic features of organisms that allow them to, to diversify. Um, and this is getting into functional morphology. You can look at principles of engineering, um, how, how shape is constrained by trade-offs or optimized to, uh, to be specialized for different, based on different trade-offs. Um, and that's going to be part two of my talk. And then the very last few slides, I'm going to talk about a sort of a current project that I've been working on um, that falls within these categories, but is kind of my, my recent thing that I'm most excited about. Okay, so I study the palpamanoidea. This consists of five families. Uh, they're sister to the intelligine, and they're paleoendemics, which means at one time they were more abundant and widespread back in the Mesozoic. And now there are some, you know, still exist, they still live today, but their habitats are sort of a former, their distribution is sort of a former, is restricted compared to what it was in the past. And there are five families. This is a lateral view, legs removed. You have these, sorry, five extant families. There are additional families in the fossil record. Um, and two of these families, the Mechis mauconidae or trap jaw spiders and the Archaeidae or pelican spiders, have a lot of interspecific morphological variation. And these are the two families that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and this, the morphological variation that you see, um, it, so what we're seeing is the carapace is lifted up into this really weird shape. And these muscles have sort of reoriented themselves. Um, but there, there's a lot of variation in, in this morphology, interspecific, so between different species in the family. And this variation doesn't seem to relate to sexual selection. You know, it's not sexual, sexually dimorphic. And so you, 
you can kind of, it seems to relate to how they interact with their environment and their ecological niche. They're what the prey that they're targeting. Um, and so you can think of them as ecomorphs, right? Like the morphology kind of suggests that um, maybe they, they are occupying different ecological roles, but that's what I'm working on testing. And so this weird shape of the carapace in these two families of spiders seems to have allowed these spiders to have highly maneuverable chelicerae. So a lot of the palpamanoids are spider specialists. Um, and this one, it can lift its chelicera up at 90 degrees away from its body. It, there's its spider prey impaled on the fang at the end. And once the spider prey is dead, then it lowers it and begins to, to feed. And so palpamanoids have this extensive fossil record, likely one of the best fossil record among, among spiders, um, with fossils going back from about 170 million years ago to more recent uh, in the Miocene from Dominican amber. But they're in Burmese amber, the uh, Baltic ambers. And so um, they they also so they they were around in the Mesozoic. Uh, this was kind of when they were the most abundant. As, and as part of my research, I've done divergence dating analyses. This phylogeny here incorporates about uh, ninety five percent of the known palpamanoid fossils, and then a few of the oops. Here we go. A few of the the living groups, which are at the end here. This is a dated phylogeny, so the branches reflect time. The the um, time or they're calibrated to time and what we see is that these four there are these four main groups in the palpamanoidia and they existed prior to when pangaea broke up but then within each of those four groups diversification occurs you know in the cretaceous end of the jurassic right around the time when pangaea was splitting apart so these spiders their um diversification patterns seem to relate to continental continental drift and this is an ancestor uh, range, re ancestor estimation of the ancestral range on that same dated phylogeny. And it shows similar patterns of um, what I was talking about, vicariants where the ancestors are widespread and then these with different daughter lineages splitting apart as the groups um, diverge. And so what this means is that these spiders are really old and they sort of likely drifted on the continents and what we have is that on different continents, you have different, you have monophyletic groups of these spiders on different continents. And it sort of creates uh, these different laboratories that you can study and compare why did diversification happen? You know, there's greater rates of morphological diversification in one area compared to others. So it's a really nice system for looking at this. And these spiders don't disperse. So you don't have these chance events like what we saw in the um, Hawaiian honey creepers where they're dispersing to islands and radiating. Instead, it's a different pattern and they're much older and it, they seem to be uh, drifting with the continents. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into part one of my talk, which is looking at the extrinsic factors that possibly relate to um, these spiders diversification. And so I'm gonna start talking about the archaeids. And these spiders have this weird distribution where you have the, um, the a bunch of fossils, more than what's shown here from the Northern Hemisphere. But the extant, the living groups are all found in the Southern Hemisphere. And again, you have these sort of monophyletic groups on each of these areas, Australia, Madagascar, and South Africa. And this is like very likely due to breakup of the continents. And so one thing I noticed from doing field work in, in these three areas where the living groups occur is that in Madagascar, you have what appeared to me to be far more variation in the morphology of the neck and the car uh, sorry the carapace and the chelicerae. Um, these spiders also in Madagascar occur in sympatry. Some areas I could go and collect seven species living, you know, at the same time in the same area. Um, and I also noticed that their habitats were shifting more. You know, they were up in the vegetation, down on the ground, in in both areas for some species. Whereas you didn't see these patterns in Australia and Madagascar. And so my question was why? Uh, in South Africa, most of the species look like this and they live in allopatry with their uh, other species. There is one instance of the neck elongating and that species does live in sympatry with, a, with one of the short neck species. In Australia, 
you have a range from short neck to long neck species, but they are, are for the most part in allopatry, you know, up on these different mountaintops. And you don't get any more variation other than just the neck length. So you don't get tilt, the weird head shapes, different shape, uh, scale where some get really large body sizes. And so to start testing some of these questions and trying to figure out, is there this increased rate in Madagascar I needed a dated phylogeny, um, which is what you see here. So again, the branches are proportional to time and we see these oops, monophyletic groups in each area. And this phylogeny can then be used to test questions about how diversification is proceeding. What I also did was for, uh, for all the archaeid species that I had access to, I took morphological measurements to try to um, quantify the shape of the carapace and the calissary. And then using the, using the dated phylogeny and all of those measurements, I was able to test, look at um, rates of trait diversification. And so um, this here is a morphospace plot. And this is taking all the morphological data and sort of condensing it down into one species. Each, each point is a, is a different species, and it's just a way to visualize their morphology. And what we can see is that Madagascar occupies a much greater space on this morphospace plot compared to the groups in Australia and South Africa. But of course, we need to understand is that... Um, if that's an actual due to an increase in rates of morphological evolution. Um, and so I ran a test um, where you can estimate the diversification rates and found that Madagascar, there was statistical support that Madagascar had higher rates both in morphology, morphological diversification, and also in habitat diversification. So from going to the trees, to the ground, um, compared to Australia and South Africa. And I also looked for correlations between, so I found, I, I felt from my field work that these montane areas were important for, um, for archaeid distribution or archaeid evolution and um, found a correlation, a statistically significant correlation between altitude and um, endemicity up in these. So the, these montane areas are important to, to the di diversification of the group. When you look at the phylogeny, you see patterns like this, where sister species are in, you know, are allopatric from each other. They're up on these uh, high mountain areas. And then the closest relative to that is then, you know, maybe on the same mountain area. So you seem to be getting this pattern where mountains are important for building up these uh, sympatric communities of archaeity. Um, and I looked, I, I wanted to ask whether morphology does, you know, what does it relate to? Is it adaptive? Uh, what, what is the reason? And I noticed that the, the long neck species were generally up high in the vegetation and the short, the ones with the really short necks were down on the ground. There were some species that were found in both areas. But I wanted to test this, so I ran a, a phylogenetic generalized least squares um, analysis, and this found a um, correlation between morphology and habitat. So the long-necked, the, the species with a great neck were up in the vegetation, and the short ones were down on the ground. And the, so how, but why, why, why do we see this? I don't really know. And as part of my future work, I would like to really get at this. It could be that they're targeting a different composition of prey, such as there's more arachnoids up in the, up in the vegetation versus ground runners on the ground, um, or that they have different lifestyles. This is a species, so they, they hang upside down and they carry their egg cases. This is a female and that's her egg case beneath her. And they, so the point here is that it could just be due to, to their, they walk around upside down and maybe in the vegetation there's more space. And so that lifted. I'm glad you could get longer. all made it. Please I don't know. have a seat, relax. And so this, the, the paper um, that I just presented there, about the posters, it was really looking at patterns who are in of the evolution. So I, was, I, I put up your poster looked, again you know, in room from field work, so looked and saw these patterns and then tested again, for correlations. 
But they the, really appreciate the, your good work. What this allowed me to do was come up with a hypothesis, which However, I'm currently working on. We don't on have testing. the pins up yet. And that and hypothesis aren't is that the Madagascar compared to Australia and South uh, Africa possibly had around the room. more ancient, will be, uh, so more longer and more a more uh, turbulent by, by geoclimatic history, okay. but which led to forests um, contracting right and expanding. Which so then the species another living reminder, on these mountaintops, um, no they became widespread, and then they became restricted items, so back again to the, right the to montane areas, the banquet, when we have and to that sign this an allowed for a, a um, then accumulation a of symbiotic species um, in the these mountain areas. And so, therefore, the, the hypothesis is that the morphological at, uh, diversification that we're canceled. seeing in Madagascar therefore, is being spurred by these sympatric species that are, you know, in comp competition with their close relatives. Would give us and so, their the uh, morphology is diversifying. They're right, everybody going agrees? into different ecological hey, roles. Awesome. Um, so, we'll send an email around to, to everybody reduce this competition. Because, um, and not totally in South Africa, in Australia, they had a much more stable the climate right now, until the sure Miocene, knows, right? um, so, about so about um, 20 million Jones years ago, where you had in South Africa the uplift of the Great Escarpment, um, and in Australia, then uh, this we of course will try to where have the archaeids there became allopatrically, you know, isolated. <laughs> but it was more recent. You haven't had these you know, repeated patterns where you get these sympatric communities being built again. up. So, so that's the um, hypothesis. The um, There's open lunch, I, open dinner. Currently, I'm working um, on testing have, this idea. Um, story and to do so, I'm looking specifically at, um, at this, um, what's called the Work Manai group. This was a group of spiders yes, that I described uh, um, in 2018. Uh, seven, uh, There's seven, five species. PM in the, um, they are um, some of the more abundant and, um, and also the more yeah, majestic so looking archaeids in Madagascar. The they have these long necks. Lucky, yeah. um, and you have this one species. Yes. Workmanai, which is um, more, so which is pretty widespread on the is, island. This is and the other. If you cross uh, species the street, have more right here, the um, building like this reduced along ranges. Tower Road and so this was a good group mud. that I thought to um, I don't um, see ask Jay, these questions because the, they Jay, there are some populations sure the front door is where they're living in Allopatry and some way, populations go where their ranges are overlapping in Sympatry. And so I wanted to examine kind of if possibly Atrium character displacement area. is occurring, and that's what's spurring morphological diversification. So I'm trying to I think directly that was it for the announcement. some of the, the hypothesis from nope, uh, the, that Sorry. previous paper. <laughs> Incidentally, Come this is Ian. what the, um, according to the molecular so phylogeny, this is what the closest relative I'll be looks bringing, like, has uh, a really short neck, and it's over found to the table. You know, in the, in the but, leaf litter. Uh, Siddharth uh, Kulkarni wanted to remind and me, and so we have that, these five species. Uh, he has the book, um, and spiders this is work Manai's range. It's, it's much more widespread, India, and then you have this overlap give, uh, um, between AB, you know uh, some populations in Sympatry, some in Allopatry. members twenty five percent off. And so the first of the step book, where where I am right now is that I've ran, uh, I've, I've at, built uh, a phylogeny population level of the break, uh, using ninety five so, ninety five percent of the material is from museum specimens using target enrichment of ultra conserved elements yeah. what and Paula the, just the said is the next international here, meeting it confirms this in the, India, the, so the you know the species hypotheses handy. of wood and sharf where you have these five species this is work money um i think that and concludes however the let's zoom into so, work here's uh we'll give you a minute five is to assemble and then we'll Workmani. start your official and so i'm going to zoom into that part of the phylogeny and if we look at that part of the phylogeny here's um what we see so this you have a population here from this one sort of mountain area. This is Rana Mafana National Park, if people are um, familiar with Madagascar. And then next, it's sister to a group that occurs in the southern, um, mo the, there are these mountains down here in the south. Next, we have um, a population up on this high mountain, Andragitra. And then again, we have another population that's found up in that purple area. The next population is down here again in those southern mountains. And then we have another population again in Ranamafana. So when I'm collecting in Ranamafana, it's extremely confusing. I have my species hypotheses, which is based on the genitalia, and it's very, very subtle differences. You have to expand the male genitalia in order to see the differences between the five species that, that were described. And then looking within Workmani, Workmani, I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you that in Rana Mafana and also in um, 
down here in this southern area, it just feels like there there's so much diversity and I can't quite um and it seems like it's more based in scale, body size getting bigger, pattern, color pattern, uh, the neck shape. So more possibly more ecological characters. And I think that there's cryptic speciation in here, um, but I'm I'm working to sort this out. And so then you have these other groups, you know, further further on the northeast coast of Madagascar. And so this really suggests that these um, mountain areas are important for speciation and that you're getting these really deep divergences between what I'm calling a species. Um, and so the next question is now testing for character displacement. And I don't have results from this yet, but I'm currently um, examining the morphology. So taking morphological measurements for all of the populations of all of those species, because for that one area, for example, where I spoke about work manai in Rana Mafana with those three different groups, you also have other species, you know, other from the workmanite group that, that co-occur. So there is a lot going on um, in some of these areas, and I want to look, test for character displacement. Um, and so the idea behind character displacement is that allopatric populations in, uh, look more similar, look pretty similar to each other. Um, and then when you get in sympatry, that maybe you're getting some morphological differences so that they're reducing competition between their close relatives and targeting, you know, sort of separating into different ecological niches, such as, you know, the net getting a little bit shorter, maybe this getting the net getting longer and the body size getting larger. And I, again, I'm, I'm want to test that go back to Madagascar and test this for diet and habitat as well. And I think, yeah, so, so this is, um, this is the end of part part one of my talk where I'm talking about these external features. And so what we can see, just to summarize that, what we see in the archaeids is that, you know, these external events seem to be very important. You know, this work suggests that these external events are sort of spurring morphological diversification in the archaeid spiders. Okay, now I'm going to switch focus. I'm going to switch to a different family, the Mechis Malconeids, um, and start talk talking about the intrinsic features of the the morphologic so the traits that are diversifying now um the the mechis malconia these are called the, we've called them the trap jaw spiders um but they share similar patterns to what we saw with the archaeids but i'm not really going to go into detail with that and i haven't done a lot of research on it yet but they have two monophyletic groups one in new zealand one in southern south america those are the only two areas where the extant members occur and you get a similar pattern where in New Zealand, they're all in allopatry. They all, all the species look pretty similar. And in um, Southern South America, you have sympatric, uh, sympatric species. You can get five or six in one area living in the leaf litter. Um, and you get a lot more morphological diversification. So we see these similar patterns repeated in, in this group. Okay, so but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm talking about their the the functional morphology of these spiders. So they open their their calissary, you know, like a trap. They've got the those are the fangs. They've got these long hairs that project forward, and then they snap their their calissary closed really fast. And this is um, so what I think is going on. Um, well, based on the speeds of the calissary, this like this has to be going on. Um, is that they're producing these elastic driven movements um, where energy is slowly stored into a spring that then is rapidly released. And that's um, similar to a catapult or a bow and arrow where you slowly put energy into a system, then you release the latch and you, the arrow flings away. Um, and these elastic driven movements have been shown throughout the, the tree of life. They're in plants, they're in animal, you, you know, across animals. Um, and, but the most, the most charismatic ones are in the smallest organisms. Um, and that's because when things, when your body size is really small, it's really hard to produce fast movements and these powerful movements. And so evolving these, um, elastic driven movements allows you to overcome that constraint for these little tiny organisms. Okay, so for, for my research, I do a lot of micro computed tomography scanning. And this is where you take a specimen, um, you put it in a 
like a big MRI machine, but with a really strong X-ray beam and you rotate it and you get these two dimensional um, X-rays that look through, through the specimen. And the reason why I'm, I'm doing this is because I want to understand what's inside these spiders, how their muscles, try to get at the mechanism, try to figure out the morphological changes that are occurring in these groups. Um, and these spiders, this specimen here, the, the carapace length is less than half of a millimeter. So it's very it would be very challenging for me to dissect. But using microcomputer, these CT scans, I'm able to see um, internal features really well. And so once you get those, those, all those x-rays, you put them together, you make this, you know, image stack, and then you can sort of digitally dissect this image stack here. This is looking at the anterior view of a spider. And here, here are their venom glands. You can see the muscles that wrap around the venom glands. Um, here you can see the duct. The, so these two structures are the chelicery. And there you can see the duct running through. And then you can see the muscles that go. You, you can even look here and see the different sarcomeres of the, of the muscle. Okay, and then, you know, this is the carapace. These are the legs. Um, but you can then take this image stack and segment out the structures of interest and get a, three, a 3D shape that you can then run shape analyses on or 3D print it. And so as part of my work on the, the palpamanoids and on the trap jaw spiders, I, I wanted to look at these chelicerol muscles because, right, they're doing some pretty amazing things in the trap jaw spiders as well as in other the other palpamanoids. And so my first step was just trying to understand homology of these muscles. And when you when we look at spider chelicery, we don't really know what's going on. There were some anatomical descriptions that were done maybe 20, 40, 60 years ago. And from there, they kind of made hypotheses about the movements of these muscles, but we really don't know. Um, and so my first step was looking at palpamanoids and just trying to figure out the which muscles are homologous to the other. And I came up with this, this hypothesis for homology and it's all the muscles are color coded. But around that, the chelicerol bases, you have eight to nine different sets of muscles that surround, um, surround those bases producing these very complicated movements. And this is not just in palpamenoids, this is in all spiders. Okay, so then the, the next thing I, done, I did um, was looked just at the trap jaw spiders, the species, and I, you know, I observed this behavior of them with their weird chelicery that they would open. And I started recording them with a high-speed video camera. Um, and what I found was that different, so each of these lines represent the, the the kinematics of the chelicerol, the chelicery closing um, for different species of trap jaw spiders. And this is logarithmically scaled. It's speed over here and time. And um, what we have is that there's this group that has these really fast elastic driven movements and sort of the chelicery just come and close and smash together. And then you have this group that seems to be having have these muscle driven movements, which is more like what what we're familiar with. Um, and you can see that the they sort of accelerate and then they they slow down. Whereas up here, the chelicery just kind of smash together. Um, and this, for simplicity, I'm treating this as like two discrete categories. But you know. Biology is more complicated than that. And I acknowledge there, there is sort of a continu, it, it is a, a little bit more of a continuous character here. Um, this, there are some species that do exhibit some intermediate characters. So, but just for simplicity, I'm going to talk about it as, you know, these fast and the slow group for this talk. And so then when we look on a phylogeny, what we see is that, um, so the black, this is an ancestor character state reconstruction for speed, right? Lumped into the discrete character of being really fast or slow. So elastic driven versus uh, muscle driven. And the black dots represent the really fast species and the white dots, the slow species and the gray areas are the unknowns. Um, and so what we see is that there's independent evolution. You know, all those black dots don't cluster together. Instead, there's independent evolution of this fast strike four times. 
Um, however, this study had, there's a lot more work to do than what was done here. And so this study just dealt with average speeds and it didn't come up with a mechanism for what was actually going on and what, which is what I'm most interested in, which is what, what are the, the morphologies that are shifting to produce these movements? And so what I did was I looked at this group just from New Zealand. You have two genera in New Zealand. You have, um, and you have Zearchia, which is the smallest. These are the smallest ones. Their body lengths are less than two millimeters and they produce the fastest movements. Um, and their sister to this monotypic genus, which um, at the time I didn't know whether it was fast or slow, but the morphology of it, I suspected that it was slow. And so I wanted to look at this group where they're sister to each other. You know, they at one time shared a common ancestor and then they went on these extremely different paths and what was the morphology that shifted? How did we arrive? You know, how did this, what was the morphology that shifted to produce these two extremes um, that were at one time shared an ancestor? And so I started um, recording them with a high-speed video, you know, got lots of shots for each of the different species I looked at. And on the left, you have the slow Aotearoa. On the right, you have a uh, Zearchia. Uh, this is an undescribed species. And um, the Aotearoa, you capture the movement recording at 1,000 frames per second. For Zearchia, this video was recorded at 100,000 frames per second. It's being played back 10,000 times slower than what we see in life. And so the duration, the velocity, and the velocities, um, and the, yeah, the peak linear velocities between these two species are three orders of magnitude different from these groups that once at one point shared a common ancestor. We can also see that the gape is very different. Um, the Aotearoa has a gape of about 90 degrees, whereas the gape of Zearchia is about 180 degrees. And so I started looking at the morphology. What's the morphology? What happened? And my question was, what happened to produce these extremely functionally different outcomes? Um, and so one thing that I noticed is this, the Clippius got huge in Zearchia. Um, it's huge and very thick. So it extended out and it got really thickened. And um, this was a character that Platnik, Forster and Platnik used to lump all of the fast species, right? They didn't know what the Clissary doing. They were just looking at the morphology. They put them all in one subfamily. And, you know, instead what we're seeing is no, they're scattered. This is just a, a trait that's evolved convergently. And then they have these really thick, they're these, what I call them clipial ligaments that attach to the collisceral bases up to the clipius. And you can see them in, you know, they're there in the slow species, but they're more just like a fold in the membrane. And here you can see that this is from a CT scan. Here are those really thick clipial ligaments compared to just like this little sort of thin fold. So the morphology, what we see is just a thickening of certain body parts, a thickening and, an, and an elongating. Um, and then I, you know, I came up with, I built these 3D models and um, there was this piece, I'm pointing at the, I was just pointing at the computer screen. Okay, there's this piece right in here that called the, I've called it the intercholesterol sclerite that serves as a latch. And I thought, okay, this is serving as a latch in the, um, the fast species, not in the slow species. It's actually more complicated than that. The slow species does have a latch. It has these little points here that interact with the collisceral bases and does seem to sort of lock them open and hold, hold them in place. Same with the fast species that this piece interacts with the bases and this additional sclerite down here to lock, latch them open. So that wasn't really anything new that's happened. However, due to this, this really big clippius, the, my hypothesis is this has allowed the, the calissary to open 180 degrees and they roll so far forward that um, the closure muscles, so originally they're on one side of the calisseral pivot, and then when they open so far, they switch to the other side. And this is called, so there, therefore, when you contract those calisseral muscles, you're actually helping to hold the calissary open. So this is called a torque reversal mechanism. 
Um, similar to those doors that swing, you can hold them open or closed. And this, so this seems to be what's evolved in the fast species compared to the slow species. And incidentally, as an aside, there is another trap jaw spider group uh, called the Pararchianae that has evolved, you know, trap jaw morphologies um, and behaviors. And we've looked at this group, so that, but it's distantly related. These are in the Iranioids, right? Very, very distantly related from the palpomanoids. And they also have evolved a torque, a torque reversal mechanism um, where, so here, this is sort of looking down at the chalicerol bases when the chalicerae are closed versus when they're open. So there's the fang and the chalicera. It's really simplified drawing. This dot right here represents what we think is the pivot. And you'll see that in the closed, the, the cholesterol, the closure muscles um, are on one side of the pivot. And then in the open, they move to the other side of the pivot, thereby creating a torque reversal mechanism. And that explains this weird groove that I observed in these spiders is basically just shifted the attachment point of those closure muscles way down in the in the cholesterol base, allowing for this um, this torque mechan this re torque reversal mechanism to evolve. And this is something. So now people who study these elastic driven movements, they're finding that these torque reversal mechanisms seem to be a really common trend in um, in organisms that produce these um, elastic driven movements. Okay, back to the trap jaw spiders. So um, these measurement, we scaled them. The, these are this is sort of scaled by size, but I started taking measurements of the muscles, and um, I found that some muscles have been lost in the in the fast, the fast lineage versus the slow. And this sort of gets at the idea of specialization um, versus being a generalist. And once you lose muscles, it seems like you're going down sort of a dead end road. But um, I haven't really tested that or looked at this, but I'm really excited about muscles lately because you can sort of start to quantify specialization. Here, when we, the these big purple muscles, which are the closure muscles, in the fast um, group, they've gotten really large and occupy a lot more of the, the carapace compared to the slower species. And so what we can, we can again, begin to quantify the, the morphological shifts that we're seeing. And it's really kind of minor things, right? Muscles are getting bigger. They're sort of slightly reorienting themselves. You're getting um, just sort of these little minor morphologies. You can look at the, in the sarcomeres um, and what we see, you can, so sarcomere lengths in invertebrates tell you whether the muscle, the muscle fiber is optimized to be slow and for forceful versus fast and not forceful. And in the really slow, in that the, the, um, those purple closure muscles, the sarcomere lengths are really big, suggesting that those muscles are slow and forceful. And comparing the fast species versus the slow species, in the fast species, they've gotten even longer. So we're seeing shifts in sarcomere lengths, which is directly relating to how that muscle is operating. We're, okay, so here's an example of these really short, short sarcomeres compared to the long ones. Same for um, these, this is the, the muscle that, that operates that, that sclerite, the latch that sort of sits in the middle. And we can see in the slow how it's much more spread out. And in the fast, the fast species, it's gotten more narrow. And so muscle architecture is a way for us to, again, like quantify these little minor shifts and also kind of quantifying specialization. Same story with these, the histology of that, that aqua muscle. So in the slow species, you have two fiber types with long sarcomeres and with short sarcomeres. But in the fast species, you have only, they've lost the slow ones. They have only one fiber type and it's the really short sarcomere. So they're producing these really fast movements with that muscle. And again, they've lost, they're losing some abilities, you know, and becoming sort of more specialized. Um, from this work, we can come up with hypotheses. So I came up with a hypothesis for the mechanism um, that then really shows how those morphologies have shifted, you know, these little shifts to produce those extreme functional differences. So where the spring is um, and, and how it works. 
And what I've done, so this is kind of an aside, is that I've um, printed out these 3D models that actually work. You can get them to work. You put elastics in and you can, um, so the, that this was our project during the pandemic when we were home for like two years. This is my daughter. We built this model and she'd like pull the little trigger and the clissory would snap close. And we made these videos of oh, the sounds on. So it's really fun. And then you can tweak the, the elastics, like you can make the elastics thicker or thinner, and you can run actual experiments on these 3D models, which has helped me to understand the mechanism and to get a, get a hypothesis for the mechanism. Um, this is currently unpublished data, but you can then take those videos and analyze the velocities, accelerations, and tweak parts of your model. Um, okay, that was a little bit of an aside. Just a summary um, for this talk is that, um, so morphological diversification. So from the first part of my talk, it does seem that these external factors are what's spurring morphological diversification, where you have these different land masses with different patterns of morphological diversity, likely due to geoclimatic events causing sympetry with close relatives, which may be a spurring morphological diversity. And it seems these external factors are very important. However, you do, you do need a trait that can be sort of worked on. You need a trait there that, um, that produces where you can make these minor tweaks to the trait to produce these large functional differences. And so what we're seeing in the, the, um, the morphology is we're not seeing novel invention. It's not like the high-speed mechanism has evolved independently um, in and of itself is a novel thing. Instead, we're just seeing these little minor tweaks to produce these very large differences. And that's kind of what we, what we expect and what we know of how evolution operates. Okay, so that's the summary from these first two parts of the talk. I'm just gonna now talk really briefly, I have a few slides, um, and talk about my current research. Um, and so working on these trap jaw spiders and the palpaminoids with their weird, unusual cholesterol morphologies, I became well, first I needed to understand what is basic spider cholesterol function that I can compare because I'm working on these highly derived groups. And so I started looking in the literature and of course there's nothing, we know nothing about spider cholesterol function. And so currently in my lab, we're looking across spiders and trying to understand this. <clears throat> this work is done in collaboration with Jeff Schultz at the University of Maryland. And so I'm trying to take take the different components of the spider cholesterol, right? You have the carapace, the paturon or cholesterol base and the fang. Um, and there's this little structure here, which is totally, no, nobody has looked at or really understand. And it's, I recognized it because it's so important in the palpaminoids and the trap jaw spiders. It's this little intercholesterol sclerite, which occurs throughout spiders, apparently has muscles attached to it. And I think that it's very important in spider cholesterol function, which, um, and so we're working now across spiders to try to understand this really complicated system, which has two joints, right? The fang joint that moves, and then, which is actually, that's a pretty simple joint. One plane of movement, two opposing muscles, versus this joint up here, the paturon bases, which is extremely complicated. And so as a, a part of our study, this was work with Bob Kalal, and we just looked across spiders, did some basic uh, segmenting of the, you know, the, the carapace, the, these different parts, and looked at morphospace and looked at shape evolution. Bob tested integration versus modularity and found that among these different parts, you have both. So some parts are integrated with each other and then others act as individual modules. And this was kind of a first pass at just looking at the diversity in spider cholesterol. However, Bob did not tackle that intercholesterol sclerite because there's no homologous points on it. It's just this weird thing with all these shapes and we didn't know how. Um, so I now have this postdoc, um, Corey Black, who is tackling, taking on this, this little sclerite and again, all of this work is in collaboration with Jeff Schultz as well. And so what we're doing is looking at the shape and we're, we're looking at the muscles, we're writing um, R scripts to actually, 
um, output what we anticipate the muscle forces would be produced um, based on the, the architecture of the muscle and trying to understand what's going on with this, with this weird little sclerite. This is a morpho space plot of the, that sclerite shape. Um, and Corey did figure out a way to apply landmarks using some novel methods um, to this weird shape. And what we see are huge differences in the uh, morpho morphological shape of this structure. And um, when she did a preliminary study looking at rates of evolution, this structure is evolving at extremely high rates compared to the carapace, the paturon, the fang. And the question is why? So my working hypothesis, or my hypothesis is that this structure is, is um, what it's doing is shifting function multiple times throughout the spiders. It's either operating as a depressor muscle, which you'll see in Lephistius or Aphonopelma, or sorry, the mygalomorphs and the mesotheli. And then in the Araniomorphs, it seems to have shifted in position. And now it's operating to close the chalicery in unison, sometimes as a depressor, and most importantly, possibly as a facultative pivot, which is a big word. I didn't know what it meant. Ask Jeff Schultz. I can explain it a little bit more later at the end. But um, and and what I think is happening is that this is just shifting function multiple times in spiders and allowing them to do different things with their chalicery. So this is uh, David Canseco Vielma. He's currently in my lab as a as an intern, and he's looking over the summer. He's tackling just this fang joint right here, and the muscles, the um, which again is a simple movement. But we're kind of asking questions about how muscle across spiders, how these muscles work, and how that affects paturon shape <coughs> across different spiders. And then you have the venom glands that run through here. And if you have a duct versus a gland, how that affects um, shape and movement of the fangs. Uh, Megan Ma is a grad student in my lab and Megan is tackling several aspects of this for her dissertation research. But um, one is looking at fang shape. So looking at how fangs are optimized for um, grasping versus for puncture. And you have this trade-off and looking at sort of shape evolution of the fangs. Amy, Amy Peshku is an undergrad at University of Maryland, and she's doing working on a lot of the segmentation for all of our CT scans looking across spiders, working with Megan. And then Megan's also tackling that articulation, the really complicated articulation between the paturon and carapace. Um, and so recording across spiders, trying to understand just the differences of the movements, looking at the CT scan, seeing the morphological shifts that occur um, in these different, different lineages of spiders. And so stay tuned for those results. Hopefully in the next few years, I'll be presenting more about um, this, this current study. And so that's the end of my talk. Thank you again to the hosts and thank you for, for listening. Yes. Question. Oh, no, now it's on. Okay, so I will try to pass around the microphone. And uh, Hannah, if you could please repeat oh, the questions. First of all, that was amazing talk. So good. Um, a lot of questions. Um, two important ones. One, why do they eat other spiders? What do you think? <sighs> so the palpamanoids were around in the Mesozoic. And then again, this is just my hypo, I don't know why, but I think then the, the modern spiders evolved and the way that the palpamanoids survived is they began to prey on the modern spiders. You know, it's their sister, their sister lineage, their sister relative or the intelligines. And you have the Araneoids in there. They seem to be targeting a lot of Araneoids and but then they also target RTA clade as well. But I think that that's how some of these groups have, that maybe they switched to preying on spiders. They became spider specialists. So not maybe because like they diversified prior to infrared radiations? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And I don't know if we're ever going to know. Yeah. My other question, if I can sneak it in, is what about trade-offs um, 
with the like very big, long jawed ones and the venom glands in terms of, you know, musculature and size of venom glands and yeah. ducts and all that stuff. I'm sp- I just remembered I'm supposed to repeat the question. So the trade-offs between in the, the archaeity, the pelican spiders with the venom glands and the long, the really long calissary. When you look at the venom glands, it's crazy in these spiders. They don't have ducts that run through. Instead, the venom glands, they start, you know, the venom gland starts at the base of the fang. The, the duct kind of goes through the fang. And it goes all the way up the calissary, curves down and goes down through that neck. They have huge venom glands, huge. And they like wrap through. It's bizarre to see the CT scans of these. Um, the trade-offs, yeah, I think the um, I think for these spiders, their fang muscles aren't that, they're not going to have that robust of closure. You know, they're mostly impaling. And then they're sort of just holding the spider prey at the end and they don't need, they're not really doing these strong, you know, strong grasping. Instead, they're just sort of holding that, waiting for it to die. And I suspect they have venom specialized on other spiders because the spiders die really quickly. But that would be a, a, an amazing topic to look at. Yeah. I, I concur. Amazing talk. Um are you combining this with finite element analysis to like, you've got these big broadsword slow ones versus the rapiers coming in to actually look at what kind of impact. Megan, you- Megan might be doing that. I haven't done any finite element analysis, but that's, uh, so the question is, is whether I'm doing finite element analysis on these, these spiders. And yeah, I would love to, this is a great group for doing that. And we're thinking of looking at, um, I think what you're talking about is actually modeling the movement. Yeah, so I tried to do and that the material before. properties and all that. I tried to do that before with a um, with an engineer, and this was way at the beginning before I understood spiders. And he kept asking me, "What's the pivot? Like, where's the pivot?" I was like, "Well, it's just membrane around the the calisseral bases," and that's another pro- with Jeff and I. You know, we're trying to understand like what the actual pivot is. It's not like a joint where you have these sort of interlocking pieces that that tell the movement. Instead, you're. I think the how, you know, if you have a little bit of membrane, you're not going to have that much flexibility. And so maybe the member, you have a lot more underneath that, and that is somehow operating as a pivot. And I think I know where the pivot is in the trap jaw spiders, but we're trying to understand that across all spiders. And once we figure that out, um, and I think it relates to those chylum pieces, you know, I think those are interacting, helping guide the movement. When you have um, spiders that like your basic spike, basic ground runner. The the car- the the calissary are kind of wedged pretty tightly between the carapace and the mouth parts, and so that's probably cr- guiding some of the movement. But then for these guys, there's so much m- membrane around the calissary bases that we're we're trying to sort through all that. And once I figure that out, yeah, then then I think we can do some of those finite element analyses. Oh, sorry. You'll, you'll be next. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask if the, the prey is like two postcodes down with these giant arms, how does the spider actually get the digested food into its mouth? So it, <laughs> the mouth parts are still, you know, down at the base, close to the, like the coxy and the pedipalps. And so they just, all they do is then lower once the, once the spider's dead, they lower the chalicera down to those mouth parts and that's when they feed so, but they wait they use their front legs to kind of tap it and make sure that it's dead and then they lower oh yael i think a microphone's coming sorry and the the question that i just answered was how do they feed when they have those long chalicera uh, that was a good question. Um, so in the other groups, for example, of palpamanidae, um, that don't have any of these uh, weird mouth part modifications, um, they're also spider predators. Do what? Do they have any morphological modifications comparable to what you see in these trap jaw spiders, yeah. or is it just all one? So Yael, Yael was asking about the um, the modifications in the outgroups to the, so the other palpamanoids that don't have the weird carapace and clisserian, the answer is yes, they do. They So the palpa, 
the Palpa Manids, which I'm I'm currently doing a lot of work on. They're also they're known spider specialists. And um, they have, so they're these sclerites that run, they essentially have like evolved a foramen around the collisceral bases, same as what you see in the archaeids and mechis malconians, but they just haven't elongated up. So their cholesterol kind of go out and they have this space between the indites and the, the cholesterol bases. Um, palpamanids are weird because they've got those big legs with the scopulae. And they're, I think those are more important for their attacking other spiders because they go in and invade retreats. But there are, again, like what I was talking about with the trap jaw spiders, there are these minor modifications. As you go from like a non-palpamanoid to a palpamanoid to the archaeids, you do see these little shifts in the morphology um, where you have, they're kind of intermediates, but yeah, they haven't gotten the really long, um, carap the, the really elongated carapace and chelicery yet, but there are modifications. Yeah, yeah. I was just uh, curious if you're able to estimate perhaps a theoretical maximal speed given the various biological constraints that you know about so far. So like a th of the trap of the jaw, jaw spiders. Yeah. So yeah, we would love to do this. I think Jeff and I, our first NSF that we wrote that was rejected, we wanted to like map theoretical morpho space and theoretical functional and like using these models, you know, try and tweak this and see how morphology is constrained. We haven't gotten to that yet, but yeah, I would love to do that. I don't know how it's really complicated, but I think once you have a system where you can just have an equation to explain the speeds, you can then start to tweak these different parameters and get at like what theoretical space of movement. And I would love to be able to do that, but I haven't yet. It's great talk, and thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned about this, say, uh, the muscle lost in fast species, and then uh, it could be possible the muscle is not lost, it's just fewer muscles in fast species based on your phylogeny, because the fast species in the basal of the phylogeny. So the, the, I don't think I said the muscles are lost in the fossil species. I was talking about the fast trap jaw, oh, okay. the really fast, because for the, the fossil species, you, there, you, there's no internal soft tissue that's preserved. You kind of get this impression of the external shape, mm -hmm. but, um, but I don't know anything about the musculature of the fossils. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. I've been listening to the other questions and thinking about this whole specialization thing. Also, you said, you know, it seems like um, with the pelican spiders, there can be these sort of extreme specializations that are not reversible. And I'm wondering how specialized are they on specific spider prey? And could that be responsible for, you know, um, sort of the lack of extant species in northern hemisphere yeah so the when i was talking about the specialization with the muscles and i'm sure this is going on with the pelican so sorry the question was about specialization in the muscles and losing muscles and how the muscles are becoming more optimized in certain groups and i know the most about the trap jaw spiders in that regard so the mechis malconians but the mechis malconians like the pelican spiders also have fossils um, in the Northern Hemisphere, they, they have almost the same pattern. Um, and sorry, now I forget what your question was. My Whether question that is relates how to... extreme are is their special? Do they, so, do they focus on specific yeah, spider species so as prey? I can, I can answer that based on five observations in the field. So the, the trap jaw spiders are incredibly cryptic. We don't know anything about them. Um, in the lab, they will eat spiders. They'll also eat Drosophila. They kind of eat whatever you feed them. However, in the, in the field, the five observations we have observed, they cap, they have other, other spiders in their chelicery. But that was for the slow species, the larger species that you observe, you know, they're, they're much easier to observe. 
Then those fast species, which again, I'm talking like a handful of observations in the lab. I can't get them. They won't eat anything, but I stick in a columbula and they'll eat a columbula. So a, maybe they're, so columbula have a, a high speed escape response. They're also, um, from what I know of columbula, they're, there's some they out in the world, power amplification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use they use power amplification, and so it's they sort of an arms race. They also use predator. exactly, and they use they're in these really cold areas, and the really fast ones, they're like cold adapted. And I think that they're and when you're when you have movements that are based on elastics, unlike with muscles, the cold will slow you down. But these elastic driven movements, you can be fast in really cold environments, and. Um, same with Columbula. And I think that maybe they're targeting Columbula, the really fast ones, but I don't know. It's such, we don't know. I would love to do gut content analysis or something like that, but yeah. I'm just curious about how specialization maybe drives species to extinction if yeah. they can't yeah. sort of, um, if they're at like a theoretical maximum for their power amplification mechanism yeah. um, and their specific food source goes extinct yeah yeah no it exactly. would seem that they're pretty much gonna go Gone. extinct as yeah well. and like how can you go back once you're at this high speed have this mechanism how do you go back to like you can't go back to being slow you know you've lost muscles you're but maybe you can i don't know because eyes re-evolve sometimes yeah i i don't know yeah yeah so yeah reversibility of power amplification mechanisms yeah. <laughs> that that sounds awesome Thank you very much. I think that concludes our, our morning session.